Hey everyone, Jimmy Smith of Good Water Warehouse here. Better water means good water products. Let's talk water. Hey there everyone, today's Let's Talk Water episode number 3 tutorial is titled The RO Explained. In it, we will discuss the residential RO system and associated components. The image of our Gold Line 50 is likely familiar to most of you. It is rated as a 50 gallon per day system with the WQA, which stands for Water Quality Association, and their Gold Seal certification to the NSF and ANSI 58 standards. This is a major selling feature of this model because this ensures the consumer of an outstanding product that is quality assured. Now, the Gold Line is a traditionally designed product which makes it a great example for today's discussion. Its design is typical on most residential RO systems found throughout the world's marketplace. The beginnings of the RO is interesting as it stems way back to the 18th century. A French scientist and physicist by the name of Jean Antoine Nolet discovered, or at least announced, the theory behind reverse osmosis in 1748. Then, in the 1940s, RO membranes were developed for seawater desalination, followed by 1959, really taking the membrane to what we now know it as being today. Polymers were used, and they created the cellulose acetate membrane, or CTA as we typically call it, and then the thin film composite which we simply call the TFC. The TFC is primarily used over the CTA in today's world of RO systems as it produces the best quality of water between the two. RO systems are very reliable for purifying water. An RO will reduce dissolved salts in water from the earth and also metals or minerals if they are present. Various impurities or contaminants can be successfully reduced by an RO or possibly when combined with other filtration products bring the water source to a safe drinking water level. Reverse osmosis membranes used in these systems remove microscopic elements found in water. As seen in the example here, particle filtration or sediment cartridges as we all call them reduce particles both seen by our eyes or unseen by our naked eyes. However, an RO removes elements that could only be seen with sophisticated microscopes. On a level of micron reduction, an RO reduces down to a 0.0001 micron. We are only able to see directly with our eyes micron sizes that I estimate to be around 50 or 80 microns. Some of you might have wondered why we use the term reverse osmosis or what it means. To better understand this term, let's discuss what osmosis means. As seen in the image, if you had a container with water and it had a semi-permeable membrane in the center of the container, and one side of the membrane had water high in dissolved salt, and the other side with pure water or low salt concentration, the pure water would naturally pass through the membrane to the high salt concentrated side of the membrane. In fact, the high concentrated side would raise in height in the glass with water that has passed through the membrane from the purified or low salt concentrated side. This level increase or rise is known as osmosis or osmonic pressure. In the reverse osmosis process, a force is applied on the high salt concentrated side and this concentrated water is forced through the membrane in the opposite direction that we observed in the osmosis slide to the purified or low salt concentrated side, thus preventing osmosis from occurring the natural way if there were no force applied. This is why the word reverse is added to osmosis in the process we are discussing today. Additionally, in RO systems, 
we use a much more elaborate membrane that separates the high salt concentration from the water and discards this concentration of salt to the drain, leaving only purified water. Okay then, let's look at this elaborate membrane. Here is an excellent animation of how a membrane works and separates molecules in water. Water enters on the right side in this example and exits on the left, but note, the center has water flowing out called permeate. This is the purified water that is used. The water shown around the permeate is the concentrate, also called brine, but usually just simply called the wastewater. This is the water that will go to drain and back to where it came from. The purified water will be stored in a pressure tank for household use. The membrane has a center tube that is perforated. This tube is called the permeate tube. Wrapped around the permeate tube are layers and layers of polymer type material that make up the actual membrane. Water flows through these layers in a spiral direction, separating contaminants from water and sending these contaminants to the drain as concentrate. The separated purified water finds its way to the permeate tube and is stored and used as purified RO water. A big shout out to our friends at Suez for this great animation. Okay, let's get down to the nuts and bolts of RO systems. Today, I have a special guest for you. He is certainly an RO guru. I call him Super RO Man. His name is Ken Johnston. Ken, welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. Excellent. The first item that I wish to speak about uh, is regarding the, the sediment filter, which we call the pre-filter. If you're looking at the photo in the top right, you'll notice on this particular system, the flow pattern is going from right to left. We also have systems that we design that actually has the flow going in the opposite direction, which would be from left to right. So in this particular example, that polypropylene cartridge, which we refer to as a five micron filter, would be sitting in that far right sediment bowl. You could use different types of filtration in this particular example. Um, we could use a string wound or we could use a pleated. We choose to use the spun polypropylene cartridge because it's a very cost effective and a very user friendly product from the standpoint that it acts as a depth filter. So you get a lot of contaminant removal because it has the ability to take a large dirt load. Unlike a string wound, which would be very much surface loaded, it wouldn't be able to hold as much. And because we literally go through thousands of polypropylene cartridges, again, I reiterate, it's very cost effective. If you wanted to choose to use some different type of cartridge, such as a pleated, you could do so. Every one of these cartridges has a flow pattern that allows for it to go through the cartridge and up the middle as the illustration demonstrates. If we move into the second end in this particular example, the third bowl, in this particular unit example, we actually have carbon block filters in both of those bowls. In this particular slide, it's showing you that we could use a granular or a carbon block the purpose of this particular cartridge is for us to remove the contaminant, whether it be chlorine, whether it be organic compounds and so forth. The membrane that we're using inside the system design cannot be exposed to chlorine very long, so we need to make sure that we get that contaminant removed out of that water supply prior to it reaching that membrane. So you can see in this next slide, we're talking about a carbon block. We choose to use a carbon block filter because of its improved filtration layers. So a carbon block is basically formed by us compressing or the vendor compressing carbon into a solid mass. So the amount of carbon exposure that we gain or 
the absorption ability for that cartridge to remove these contaminants is extremely uh, high in this carbon block. It does create a significant path, so it, it does give a significant amount of contact time through there. You might be wondering in this particular example why we chose to put two carbon blocks here, and as we started to experience a number of years ago, there where we had chloramine coming into the scene, uh, we decided to put a secondary carbon block. So we actually have back-to-back -back carbon blocks in number two and number three bowls. The other major advantage of that carbon block is the fact that it doesn't have any fines coming off of it. So if we move now to the next slide where we are actually showing the granular, in the Canadian marketplace as well as some locations in the U.S. markets, there may be some reasons for you to use a granular activated carbon as a pre-filter. An example of this would be with you had a contaminant in that water supply like an organic, um, so if you had tannins and lignans, which may in fact blind off a carbon block filter. Blinding off means that it would not allow any water to go through it, so you really get a diminished uh, throughput and let's say the cartridge exhausts and no water's flowing through it within a, let's say three months, maybe, maybe one month, where you know you've got all kinds of capacity left in that cartridge, but you can't utilize the capacity because it's blinded off. That may be an advantage for a granular because it does not have any micron filtration and therefore would not blind off in any way. The difference between those cartridges is you would want to recognize that that granular cartridge has carbon fines that need to be rinsed out. And you would want to disconnect the feed flow to that membrane so that you do not take a brand new unit out of a box and install it and allow the carbon fines to then plug up the membrane with carbon fines. The next thing I want to talk about is the actual membrane. This is a typical example of what kind of uh, rejection ratios you would get out of a membrane. Um, and today I would have to state that an extremely high percentage of RO systems, whether we make it or a competitor makes it, everyone for the most part is choosing to use, to use a thin film composite membrane. So the triacetate membranes or the cellulose triacetate membranes are not going to be something that you're going to see uh, readily being used anymore. The thin film composite membrane has an extremely high pH range that it can actually work under, so that does not become an issue. It uh, works well within a, def a definite range of, of temperatures, and it handles uh, a very high rejection. So that's number one are some of the reasons why we use it. Number two is, is bacteria was not going to use that membrane as a food source like it would some of the other choices. The downside to that element is it has a very, very low tolerance to chlorine or an organic uh, such as uh, ozone or uh, chloramine. So we need to get that out, which is the purpose of why we have that pre-carbon filter system sitting in front of that membrane. On the next slide, we're showing you a correction factor of what temperature does to that membrane. And the easiest way to understand this is you might have heard that that membrane might be rated at 50 gallons per day, um, but no one ever bothers to tell you that that's if the water was sitting at 25 degrees C. Um, so 25 degrees C is going to be about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. So this correction factor is showing you that the unit would actually make that kind of volume if the temperature was there. But you'll see that if the temperature was 10 degrees C, or in parts of the Canadian marketplace where the water would be 5 degrees C, it would create an even further correction factor that you would be looking at. You take that correction factor and you would divide that by what the membrane is rated to do. So in these situations, you can clearly see that a 50 gallon per day membrane may only make 25 gallons in a particular application if the water is very cold. So after it goes out of that membrane, you'll see it here on the left hand side, here is just a generic schematic drawing of a flow pattern coming out of an RO system. An integral part 
of pretty much everybody's reverse osmosis systems today is going to be a shutoff valve. And the shutoff valve is going to have two sides to it. It's going to have a feed side. It's going to have a tank side. So in a nutshell, what happens with this auto shutoff valve is it basically has a diaphragm in it that measures the back pressure in the storage tank. Most shutoff valves have a ratio of when the storage tank water gets to 65% of the feed water pressure, that diaphragm basically closes and shuts the system down. Another key integral part of the reverse osmosis system is the check valve. The water comes out of that membrane and flows through that auto shutoff valve and flows into the tank. And inside that tank is a bladder and that bladder gets expanded as that tank gets filled and that bladder of air gets compressed so back pressure is increased. So that when that faucet opens, that back pressure that's in that storage tank would actually force the water out through the post carbon filter and up through the faucet. But that's assuming that the check valve is holding. If the check valve in the membrane housing doesn't hold, then when you shut that faucet off, water unfortunately goes backwards through the membrane, which technically would screw the membrane up eventually, long term, and it would actually flow to drain. The other key component to the system is going to be on the waste of the membrane side. So we can clearly see on the membrane housing, we've got a check valve in the permeate side, which again is the good water, and we have flow restrictors on our waistline. So every single RO system is going to have some type of a flow restrictor. We're showing you the type of uh, systems that we currently would use, uh, which is an internal device up top. Very rarely are we using those types of devices. We're normally using a, a, uh, an external versus the internal. Okay? And most of them are going to have the, the flow 100 in that particular example. It's giving you an indication that that is going to be 400 milliliters per minute to drain. Okay, we're talking about a post carbon filter here and we're showing you three different photographs uh, for a reason. It, depending on the type of system that you've got, you might have the 2 by 10 which is going to be that top right. If there is a system design where one of the sumps, which is the canisters, uh, the housings, then it would contain one of those uh, either a carbon block or a GAC, as an example, as your post. Okay? And quite frankly, the purpose of the post filter is to polish the water as it comes out of the storage tank, so it doesn't matter if the water was sitting in that tank for an hour or for a week or a month. That water is going to be polished in some oxygen given back to it through that carbon cartridge, and the water is going to have good flavor. We typically would use a coconut shell carbon because it creates a sweetness to the flavor of the water. The storage tank. If you take a look at the photos of the storage tanks used, you'll notice that all of them will have a valve stem like a bicycle tire, um, which is where the air is injected into these tanks. It does not matter to that residential RO system what size tank you use, or for that matter, the number of tanks that you, you, that you use. Uh, faucets. So in the photograph, you'll notice here that we've got a great assortment of different types of faucets for you to have access to. The faucets that's included with most of the RO systems is not going to be the designer faucets, although we do have a few models of RO systems that do come with designer faucets. Wow, we're done. I'll leave this all to you now, Jim. Well, thanks, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Ken. Reverse osmosis systems for the consumer's use in their home is very popular, and they work excellent. You know, one way to measure the effectiveness of a reverse osmosis system is to measure the total dissolved solids, better known as TDS. Total dissolved solids is an accumulative number reflecting the amount of dissolved minerals, dissolved metals that are in the water. It's an easy way 
to determine how well a reverse osmosis is working. Lower the number, the more pure the water is. Reverse osmosis systems are a great product for us and you know I'm really glad that you took the time to listen in today. Our next episode is going to be on the commercial reverse osmosis system so tune in for that. Have a great day. Remember to stay safe. Smile all the time. See ya!